Welcome to this special Brennan Center for Justice event. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to repair, revitalize, and defend our systems of democracy and justice. So they work for all Americans. I am L.B. Eisen, Senior Director of the Brennan Center's Justice Program. Before we get started, there are just a few housekeeping notes. The Brennan Center is a nonpartisan organization. While we cannot support or oppose any candidate for office, we can, and today we will, vigorously debate the policies and positions that matter for our democracy. Civility is important to all of us. Those who post rude or intemperate language in our message streams here on YouTube and Facebook will be removed from the conversation. Live closed captioning will be provided. Follow along with the conversation on social media with the hashtag Brennan Center Live. Now to today's program. A few weeks ago, the Columbia University Press published Excessive Punishment, How the Justice System Creates Mass Incarceration, a book of essays that unpack why the U.S. criminal legal system is so punitive. We are excited to feature some of the authors here today. The essays focus on the United States' inability to rein in the punitive excess of the criminal legal system covering a range of issues from policing to prosecution to a lack of resources for public defense to prison conditions to life after prison. These essays explore whether these systems could have evolved differently and how we can learn from the failed experiment of mass incarceration to advance reforms that respect human dignity, do not exacerbate conditions of poverty, and promote healing and racial justice. Excessive Punishment contains 38 essays from over 40 experts. These are practitioners, activists, academics, and thought leaders who all contributed their critical voices to highlight the harms of the status quo and provide valuable insight into how we can move toward a criminal legal system that is smaller, more effective, and more humane. Now, I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists, each of whom contributed a beautiful essay to this book. Jeremy Travis is a senior fellow at the Columbia Justice Lab. Jeremy works on the role of values in the future of justice reform and has been a critical thought partner in developing this book. Jeremy also co-authored the book's conclusion with Columbia University sociologist, Bruce Western, where they write, how does the era of punitive excess come to an end? Khalil Cumberbatch is a nationally recognized formerly incarcerated advocate for criminal justice and deportation policy reform. He is a senior fellow at the Council on Criminal Justice and CEO at Adovo, an online curriculum aiming to help educate incarcerated individuals and others in corrections. And Nikichi Taifa is president of the Taifa Group LLC, a social enterprise firm whose mission is to advance justice. Author of the memoir, Black Power, Black Lawyer, My Audacious Quest for Justice. She is also founder and convener emeritus of the Justice Roundtable, a broad network of advocacy groups advancing progressive justice system reform. Nikichi is also joining us today from Geneva, Switzerland, where she is participating in meetings with the United Nations. Thank you all for contributing to this book and for joining us today for this important conversation. Jeremy, I'd like to start with you. Back in 2020 and 2021, when this series was first conceived, we had dozens of conversations with you and Columbia University professor Bruce Western to plan out this series of essays. 
you urged us to ask contributors to write about the lack of guardrails that we as a people, as a nation, have failed to erect to prevent the terrible harms that people suffer at the hands of our justice system. Can you explain this concept and why this concept of guardrails was so important to this series? Happy to do so. First of all, let me uh, tell you how wonderful it is to be with my colleagues over long many years with Nikita and uh, Khalil and congratulations to you, LB, and to the Brennan Center for publishing this really important volume at an important time. Um, and thanks to my colleague, Bruce Western, for working with me on the, the chapter and being a general advisor. So the title of this book is Excessive Punishment, and that's uh, thought-provoking. Uh, the word excessive just suggests that uh, it's we've gone too far. And this is more than some other you know, sort of world would have us uh, in terms of the use of punishment. And lurking behind that question, as you suggest, is how do we not only rein it in uh, so that we don't punish so so severely in the future, but what are the, the, the limiting principles or institutions or concepts or uh, political realities <clears throat> that would make sure that we don't do this again in the future? And so, yes, I have thought a lot about the issue of guardrails. And it's both a historical question, how did we get here? But it's also a future-oriented question, how do we make sure that we're never here again? And the Thinking about how we got here requires that we sort of think about the politics of punishment, about the tough on crime era that we've come through and that we're still in to some extent, about the ways in which race has been uh, weaponized as part of our discussion about crime, sort of playing into some of the deepest uh, and darkest parts of the American character. Uh, so it's a political process on one level, uh, but it's also very much a cultural process. Uh, uh, question is how do we how did we come here as a country? Why are we so punitive? What can we do to unravel that that part of our our national character? And I think there are we have to recognize that the the guardrails that don't exist uh, could exist elsewhere. Uh, like our constitution provides very few guardrails. The cruel and unusual clause of the Eighth Amendment is uh, has not been deployed very much by our courts. Uh, the politics of crime mean that people get elected on the tough on crime platform. Uh, and that's a winning political uh, combination, has been at least historically. So that's that's not a very strong guardrail at least. Uh, and our courts the, the administer justice, they have less and less discretion. We give less and less discretion to parole boards, to clemency proceedings. So we've really constrained the way in which we could limit the, the, the reach of punishment. So as we think about where we're headed from here, we need to go back to the politics, think about the organizing issues, think about the ways that we can uh, actually elect officials who are committed to, to reducing the footprint of the system. And most importantly, in my view, think about something very different to offer the public as a response to crime, the trauma of crime, the harm committed uh, by individuals who uh, should be held accountable, the, the experience of crime victims. So as Bruce and I put, put in our chapter, we need to really reimagine uh, the response to crime and justice in the future in order to have a more deeply embedded uh, limitation on the use of punishment as a response to crime. Thank you, Jeremy. And you mentioned, um, Punitiveness is part of our national character. And I think that is certainly a theme of the book and every essay highlights um, that statement. And Khalil, in your essay for the book, you highlight the lens, through the lens of your own experiences in the devastating immigration related consequences that a criminal conviction can have. In your essay, you wrote about how ICE officers came to your house after years after a conviction um, that was in fact a decade old at that point, even though you were a legal permanent resident, we're about to get your master's degree. Can you tell us about that experience and how it has shaped your advocacy and work in this field? Absolutely, yeah, LB, thank you so much for the question. And you know, again, thank you for the opportunity to submit a chapter to a book that I think is going to be pivotal uh, at this moment in the country's history. Uh, to echo Jeremy's sentiment, if I can, to just say how uh, 
just how honored I am to have time with him and Nikichi, of course, two absolute pillars in our field. And to be alongside of them today is really, uh, truly an honor. Um, you know, my experience with the criminal justice system uh, has been one that unfortunately did not end the day that I left prison. I think most people, when they leave prison, would like to put that experience behind them and I know that the ones who are able to do that and go on and live productive lives um, uh, still every now and then have to think about uh, some experience that they had during an incarceration. For me, uh, I had to relive uh, a, ver a very, very traumatic experience of um, being taken away from community, being taken away from family, uh, having your liberties taken away. Uh, but this time, and this time being within the context of immigration, when immigration officers came to my home in 2014 and removed me from my home, I woke up that day with the intention of going to work, going to class that evening, dropping my kids off to school, uh, being able to be a contributing member of my household uh, you know, alongside my wife. Uh, woke up in a two-parent household, and by the end of the day, uh, my wife was a single parent to two young children. That trauma is directly linked to the premise of the book, which is excessive punishment. And my vision for how uh, I see my advocacy work and the, uh, the legacy that I want to leave when folks think about the work that I've done around advocacy is undoubtedly talking about the traumatic experience of incarceration, talking about the punitive nature in which a person has to face uh, every single minute of their incarceration, but also discussing how that excessive punishment, how the notion that serving a prison sentence is not enough, the, the, the notion that uh, a person is somehow deserving of perpetual punishment, even after they've served a court assigned punishment, most of the times in this in, in the in the form of a prison sentence, really linking that notion between mass incarceration and mass deportation. And of course, this was, you know, in 2014, a very different administration whose goals were very different in terms of immigration and who they were targeting for detention and deportation. And at that time, I fit right at the top of that. And yet and still, um, I was um, treated with a complete disregard for who I was as an individual. Although, as you said, that my conviction up until that point was more than a decade ago. Although I was a working, you know, I was working, I was a taxpayer, I was contributing member of my society. I was a, you know, a, a father of two young children, as I said, and really just went about completing every single goal that that the uh, system had stipulated that I needed to complete and then went further. And, you know, as you mentioned, I was one week away from a master's, a goal that I had uh, dreamt for myself uh, during my incarceration, came home four years later, I was one week away from that and had all of that snatched away from me. Uh, uh, even to this day, I haven't, uh, you know, I, I, I never got a chance to actually walk and accept my degree. Um, and so for me, the experience of being taken by immigration was not only traumatic, it uh, forced me to have to relive all of the, uh, uh, the entire tumultuous process of trying to forgive yourself for decisions that you've made, decisions that, uh, that you regret, um, and really trying to uh, heal while you're being dragged uh, through a process that is very traumatic. Um, and then, of course, having two young children at the time, having a young family at the time, uh, was also very traumatic for them. Uh, at that time, my wife and I, we had two children. Now we have four. Um, but the two oldest ones, uh, you know, still to this day, uh, suffer from uh, a level of uh, residual trauma that shows up every now and then. You know, I travel quite frequently for work, and every time that I leave, uh, you know, my oldest, my second oldest daughter, who is now 13, who was now two years old, uh, who was two years old at the time, uh, still worries, uh, will I come home? And the reason why is because when immigration took me, uh, my wife did the best thing that she could do to a two, uh, you know, to a two and a half year old, which is to tell them something that just wasn't plainly the truth was to tell that was to tell her that, you know, your dad had to go on a work trip. And the same way that she, um, uh, viewed my voluntary leaving to go on a work trip, 
she just couldn't understand at, in a two-year-old's mind why I just could not decide to come back and why it was taking me so long to come back home. And similarly now, when I travel for work, uh, she's, she, she has that level of worry uh, because it is, a, uh, you know, it is a residual effect of my experience. And so I hope that you know, the way that I've been able to um, uh, talk about my experience is, again, being able to bridge the gap between mass incarceration, mass deportation, uh, and really say that you know that that this notion of excessive punishment it plays out in many different ways for someone with a criminal conviction, but within the immigration context, unfortunately for many people, uh, the consequence of being deported is all too often greater than the original punishment that they were assigned to by a court. Thank you for that, Khalil. And you use this phrase perpetual punishment, um, which really resonates, I think, with probably all of our listeners here today. And Nikichi, you have spent your career as a civil rights lawyer fighting perpetual punishment, advocating for an end to the war on drugs, fighting for bills that would, if passed, reduce racial disparities in our prisons and our jails. Um, you have raised awareness around the inhumanity of our justice system. And your essay in this book details a number of federal bills that drove mass incarceration, that drove and perpetuated racial disparities in our criminal legal system. Can you speak to some of the more significant policies and bills that you wrote about that, that really drove these disparities and what we see today which is 2 million people behind bars, whether they're in our local jails, our state prisons, or our, our federal prisons. Uh, yes, indeed. And thank you so very much, LB, for your phenomenal work in terms of pulling everything together for this um, uh, very critical uh, book. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for your decades and upon decades upon decades uh, 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 work with respect to this field, which actually uh, resulted in large numbers of people knowing that there are nearly 2 million people behind bars. And Khalil, your lived experience um, and what you've done with that is just served to um, open so, so many people's uh, lives. So um, as we know, most folk know it's a result of the work of people on this uh, screen, uh, that the United States has the world's uh, highest rate of incarceration with uh, nearly 2 million people behind bars. But what the general public might not know is that this mass incarceration was indeed the gradual progeny of a number of congressional bills, all of which led to the mass incarceration that we see today, which is essentially flooded the federal system with people convicted of low level and largely nonviolent drug offenses. And some of these include the um, Comprehensive Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1984, which eliminated parole, okay, in the federal system, essentially resulting in an upsurge of geriatric prisoners, okay, folk pushing their um, uh, the walkers around prison yards. Uh, we had the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which established mandatory minimum sentencing schemes, including the infamous uh, 100 to 1 quantity uh, ratio between crack and powder cocaine. We had the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, which added overly broad interpretations of conspiracy to the mix. And all of these bills were during the 1980s. During the early 1990s, I was literally walking the halls of Congress lobbying against the various omnibus crime bills that culminated in what I always call the granddaddy of them all, the Crime Bill of 1994, officially known as the Violent Crime Control and Safe Streets um, Act. And what did this book, uh, this bill do? It basically featured the largest expansion of the federal death penalty in modern times, the gutting of habeas corpus, the evisceration of the exclusionary rule, the trying of 13-year-olds as, um, uh, as adults. It included the stripping away of Pell educational grants uh, to prisoners, uh, the implementation of the federal three strikes uh, law, the refusal to equalize the crack powder um, uh, disparity. It authorized funding for 
a hundred thousand new cops on the streets with the explosion um, in racial profiling uh, that followed. And again, thank you, LB, for your essay in the book, which really detailed the federal funding um, aspects of many of these bills. And if all of that were not enough, we talked about in that 1994 crime bill, money, 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 monetary incentives to states to enact so-called truth in sentencing laws that locked up more and more people for longer and longer periods of time, essentially solidifying what I call a mentality of meanness. These were the times of a proliferation of mandatory minimum sentences that were essentially robotically meted out uh, with shockingly severe punishments of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, life imprisonment for nonviolent drug offenses. And just in conclusion, these federal bills not only led to mass incarceration, but they also fueled racial disparities with unequal treatment meted out, uh, basically faced by Black people at every stage of the criminal punishment continuum uh, from racially discriminatory profiling and wealth-based bail discrimination to non diverse juries, harshly severe sentencing uh, laws. I mean, it all has been a total and complete travesty of justice. Thank you, Nikichi. And, you know, Nikichi just listed a number of bills that drove higher incarceration rates and racial disparities. And Jeremy, I have the book behind me on my bookshelf. Um, you chaired the National Research Council's Consensus Panel on Mass Incarceration and co-edited the panel's report on the growth of incarceration in the United States, truly a seminal um, project and undertaking. And the report discussed the need for new normative values that can help reorient our system of justice. And Normative principles can act to either limit or justify the use of incarceration as a response to crime. And for example, the report discussed the principle of parsimony, the crim that criminal sanctions should be sufficient, but not greater than the punishment necessary to achieve sentencing goals. Many of the essays in this book really grapple with proportionality. And we all agree we want safe communities. We all want our kids to feel safe walking to school. We all want public safety. But public safety can be achieved without doubling down on these punitive policies like three strikes, laws that we know don't make us safer. And this um, report that you were so significantly involved in was so tremendous because of the um, the work that you and your colleagues did to highlight normative values and how we as a country want to create proportionality in our justice system. Why is it so important to include these principles in our vision of justice? Um, you know, when we talk about proportionality, sometimes the broader public doesn't really know that someone might go to, to prison for decades upon decades, um, that they may not get released in their parole hearing because of things that happened in prison um, that maybe people on the outside don't, don't actually think are dangerous, um, that people are being sent back to prison based on technical violations such as missing a court date, missing a drug treatment appointment. You know, this is the sort of disproportionality of our justice system that just scratches the surface. Um, so why is it so important that we focus on proportionality and these normative values? Thank you for that question, LB. Um, the, the report that you referenced is this uh, sort of big picture view of how we got here as a, as a country. And it's a reminder that uh, before the 1970s, the level of incarceration in America was, was quite constant for the preceding 50 years uh, at levels that look similar to what we would see in Europe right now. So the, the, the panel concluded very importantly, I think, that, that where we are now is unprecedented in American history. And it's unique internationally. We're, we stand alone, uh, far apart from other uh, democracies. 
which again raises this question of why is America so punitive? And the report goes through the politics and the and the the data and the ways in which uh, the uh, the the mass incarceration reality became a reality. But there's a chapter that has gotten a lot of attention in that report that talked about values. And this is uh, to many policy folks, this is an odd way to talk about punishment policy because we think about this as uh, as a matter of law and practice and uh, as sociology. But it really was important for us to highlight that over this period of time, when we sort of lost our way as a country and our punitive impulse was unchecked, no guardrails, not sufficient guardrails, that we also lost uh, focus on core values that have always, they're not new, always been part of a discussion about the use of state power, about the use of state power to impose pain, uh, to limit people's autonomy in the name of the criminal law. That's what punishment is. So we called out uh, that uh, sort of departure from a long tradition and called on the readers and the country to return to some core normative values, uh, one of which you mentioned is proportionality, but another one is human dignity. We think that it's not that these have always been the dominant values, but we, it used to be that people talked about rehabilitation. That was a goal, it used to be a goal of punishment. Uh, and that we thought a lot about the ways in which people interacted with, with uh, the, the systems of justice. So human dignity is important. Social justice is important. How, how do we look at the, the, the operations of the criminal justice system in the context of our democracy? Uh, but my favorite principle uh, and value that uh, we've lost, uh, um, lost track of is, uh, is parsimony. And there's a, a book that uh, came out of the Square One Project called Parsimony and Other Radical Ideas uh, About Justice. Daryl Atkinson and I uh, wrote the introductory chapter on parsimony. Uh, and it's important because it, ha it helps the mind focus on some key questions that I think are relevant uh, to this discussion today. And it, parsimony puts the concept of liberty at the center of every discussion. So when we talk about parsimony, we ask, what, what justifies the state taking our liberty, limiting our liberty, limiting our autonomy in the name of some greater good? And to what extent is that justified in terms of the values that, that are advanced. So the simple par, uh, formulation of parsimony is the state is not authorized in our name to impose limits on liberty greater than those absolutely necessary to achieve a socially beneficial purpose. So that formulation allows us to challenge everything about the criminal justice system. We talk a lot about prisons and have talked a lot about incarceration here today, but the punishment is not just through prison, not even just through prison and jail, it's also supervision. Uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Vinny Chiraldi, has a, a book called Mass Supervision, where, and Khalil referenced this in essence, so when, when, does, when does the punishment end, and how does, how does the state use its power over people's lives through parole and probation? It also applies to policing. Uh, the, the parsimony principle allows you to challenge every aspect of the exercise of, of state power to ask whether it's reasonably necessary to limit liberty in order to achieve a, a, a social a social good. So we could challenge stop and frisk. We could challenge uh, execution, execution of warrants. We can challenge uh, solitary confinement. Any way that the state operates to limit our liberty can be viewed through, critiqued through, analyzed through the, through the lens of parsimony. And what the parsimony principle does also is to, is to force a discussion about what might be a better way to achieve that socially desirable end. So you know, we, 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 our mind tends to default to punishment uh, or state power or liberty deprivations as the way to respond to, to, the, uh, to the, the crime that occurred. Uh, but let's be more creative. Let's think about other ways to, to address the, the, the harm, to, to heal, to bring people together, to resolve conflicts. And to think about accountability as being something that, that's more than a prison cell and more than a probation, more than uh, state state power. How do we think about accountability as being something that's very internal as to a, a moral question that people ask each other? What can I do to, to make up uh, in a restorative way, make for the, the harm that I've caused? So uh, parsimony is a way to, to bring values and it's a type of guardrail to back to your first question, uh, LB, it's not, it's not, doesn't have self-executing power, 
but it's a way for all of us as citizens of this country, uh, people subject to the the, uh, the laws, to ask whether with the way the state exercises its power in our name is something that we think is is appropriate and affirms dignity, solves problems, produces safety, uh, and it has the lightest touch of the state power. And, and thank you for that. And to that point, you know, we this country, the United States, um, has over 40,000 laws, rules, regulations that make it nearly impossible for people with a criminal conviction to rejoin their communities, um, get public housing, find jobs, vote. So when we talk about this proportionality, um, this perpetual punishment, this punitive excess, we really need to think about, you know, to Khalil's point, there's a sentence that a judge hands down. Can, can, I, can, someone, can I add one, one yes. thing, if I might, if I might, it'll be, the parsimony principle also holds that anything in excess of that which is reasonably required is an illegitimate, gratuitous exercise of state power. So if you, you know, fines and fees is a good example. Why do we make it so difficult for people to get about their daily lives by imposing a fine on them when they're likely already struggling uh, in the name of, of the criminal law and they have to decide between paying that and feeding their kids? That's a cruel exercise of state power. So it's a way of challenging uh, all of these uh, collateral sanctions that you mentioned. Right. Um, the inability to vote that so many people who are still serving their probation no. um, are facing. Um, and that's what happens in this country to so many people with a criminal conviction. Lil, we have a question from another contributor of the book. Fernanda Stroud, senior counsel in the Brennan Center's Justice Program, co-wrote an essay with Ali Anara focused on ways to make the justice system less punitive, such as increasing restorative justice practices and the need to redirect funding to address the root causes of crime, including housing and job insecurity. Fernandez has a question for you. Having experienced both the criminal justice system and the civil detention system in America, how has that shaped your advocacy efforts over the last few decades? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the question. Um, uh, well, one, I say, you know, there's a number of ways. One is that, um, is that the need to highlight the fact that we're not talking about two separate systems is, is critical to that point. And the reason why is because it's very easy uh, uh, to discuss uh, immigration. And I use that term very broadly because that is a, uh, that is a topic uh, not only being discussed nationally right now, but it's one that is, it's pivotal to what happens in the national presidential election. Um, but to also highlight the fact that the detention part of that and the deportation apparatus of that, particularly for people who are uh, 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 permanent residents who have criminal convictions uh, is really an extension or it's a, another head of a multi-headed hydra. And one of those other heads is mass incarceration. And it's because of some of the points that Jeremy and, and uh, to some extent Nikishi have mentioned which is that the underlying root of that is this notion of excessiveness, especially as it relates to punitiveness. So that's the first thing is to highlight that we're not talking about two separate systems. It's easy to get confused in that, but it's critical that we absolutely understand that they all share a root, particularly in the way that it's easy to other the people who fall uh, within those systems. So. Um, so that's the first point. The second point I would say is around language. And this is this I view this as a two way street. Um, I know that uh, there has been a number of pushes by a number of advocates um, to be more conscious of the language that's used as we describe people who have criminal justice involvement. That is absolutely critical. Uh, on the other side of that, in terms of the immigration piece, um, a number of years ago, there were a number of media outlets who actually committed to stop using the term immigrant um, because they felt that it wasn't fully descriptive of who it is that we were talking about, gave a ton of negative connotation to who it is that we were talking about. And, 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 and many of them committed to not use the term, oh, I'm sorry, I said immigrant, I meant illegal. 
to, to, to kind of move away from that and to really start to begin to humanize the conversation. So I see that parallel. Um, and I think that highlighting what was, you know, what happened on the immigration side and highlighting how important that is for media outlets um, uh, to take a bold stance on who it is that we're talking about and, uh, and, and, and to use humanizing language on that as well. So that's the second point around language. The third one is really to acknowledge the shared traumatic experiences that exist in both. Um, you know, I mentioned that there were a number of overlapping experiences that were not new to me when I went into the immigration detention system. And, you know, the, the whole process of, you know, removing any clothing that you have that relates to anything on the outside, being given a uniform, being given a number, being referred to by that number, being moved in a way that does not give you any autonomy. Uh, all of that are shared traumatic experience that exist. And then, of course, the ultimate one, which is going into a courtroom and being judged um, for something that you may have done a number of years ago. Um, and then the last point is uh, just that, you know, the immigration consequence, the collateral consequence of a conviction for someone who is not a naturalized citizen uh, is one of many. LB, you mentioned or you referenced the more than 40,000 legal ways that it is to discriminate against someone or for someone to face a consequence, a collateral consequence to a criminal conviction is if it falls directly into that, right? And to say that, yes, things like fair chance hiring, uh, a fair chance housing, gainful employment, being able to access benefits, being able to uh, 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 to reenter society as smoothly as possible are absolutely critical. And uh, it has shown me as an advocate that we also need to attach to that uh, the ability for someone who is a non-citizen and has a criminal conviction to be able to return to a society that they view as home. Um, when it, If I was to be deported in 2014 when I was in immigration, I would have not been welcomed back in my birth country as a as a as a citizen of that country. I would have been welcomed back very much as an outsider, as a as a, as an American who uh, just so happened to have been born in Guyana, but I would have not been welcomed back as a Guyanese national. Uh, and 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 the traumatic experience of being ostracized even after being deported is one that is uh, you know falls again directly into the camp of. Uh, ongoing traumatic and collateral consequences. Thank you for that, Khalil. And Nikichi, we have a question from another contributor of the book, Ames Square at Senior Counsel in the Brennan Center's Justice Program, who co-wrote an essay for the book with Cameron Kimball on the thousands of collateral consequences that we were just speaking mm -hmm. about that impact people with a conviction. Ames has a question for you. I was struck by some of the threads of hope and optimism in your essay. You wrote about several causes for celebration, or at least encouragement. When the Miller v. Alabama ruling was handed down, when A.G. Holder announced his less punitive, smart on crime policies, and the genesis of the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act, which, as we know, turned into the First Step Act. Are you optimistic about the future of reform in Congress? And what about more broadly in the country writ large? All right. Am I optimistic about the future of reforming Congress and in this country. And Ames, thank you for uh, that question. I think I'm gonna give a, a nuanced uh, response uh, to that. When I start uh, working on uh, criminal legal system reform during the 1980s, all of these advances that um, you mentioned that were in my um, essay, they were unthinkable. Uh, and there were few distinctions between the political parties when it came to these uh, issues. I mean, both Democrats and Republicans were horrible on criminal justice issues. I remember vividly candidate Bill Clinton leaving the presidential campaign trail to oversee the execution of a mentally charged, uh, challenged uh, person in Arkansas. Over time, however, we began to see some bipartisan uh, support for change, fueled largely by conservative politicians who themselves were becoming proximate due to their own incarcerations. One in particular, uh, Pat Nolan, who was a leader in the California legislature and got caught up in sting operation. We worked very closely with Pat Nolan um, after he got out of uh, prison. Later on, you even had Bernie Carrick, who was a former police commissioner in uh, New York who started talking about uh, reform. So the threads of hope and optimism that I spoke of in my essay are important. 
because criminal legal system reform is not only an uphill battle, it really is a protracted uh, struggle. So it is important, in my humble opinion, to celebrate gains along the way, even though they may be small, because each celebration provides fuel for the journey uh, ahead, and they hopefully will compound over time into uh, much bigger uh, wins. Indeed, whether we're talking about re-entry, whether we're talking about reducing the um, the crap powder disparity, whether we're talking about smarter crime policies or stopping mandatory life for children, focus on clemencies, et cetera, we really must celebrate along the way because oftentimes these gains of far few and far in between. So yes, while I am optimistic and believe in celebration, we must not be lulled into complacency uh, when we see the backlash, because it, which almost inevitably is going to uh, appear whenever we make strides or advancements. Uh, there's a tough on crime uh, backlash. Um, there is the backlash um, uh, against progressive prosecutors. Um, there's a rollback of bail reform uh, laws and many other backlashes across the country. Um, books being banned, voting rights uh, eviscerated, the list appears endless. So what does this all mean, Ames? I would just say it means that we must forever keep our eyes on the prize as we continue to struggle unceasingly for justice. Thank you, Nikichi. And we're going to now turn to some questions from our audience. I appreciate your positivity. And it the one of the first questions from the audience um, I'm going to ask to um, for Jeremy to answer. It's very related to what Nikichi just spoke about in terms of, you know, we are now in this time where we're seeing a lot of regression on some of the great strides we've made on criminal justice reform over the past many decades. Jeremy, can you envision a time when policymakers, decision makers, elected officials won't react with punitive measures the second we start to see a rise in crime? So I first have to say uh, it's it's just uh, heartwarming and invigorating to hear Nikishi, as I have over many decades, listen to that voice. Uh, because, I mean, she more than most people I know has been right in the in the thick of it, and has seen seen the sort of the ugliness uh, and the and the and sort of the dark times. And for to hear her uh, with this note of optimism was just uh, just uh, heartwarming. But I think I'll, I'll just draw upon our experience over a long time to answer the question from the audience. So yes, we are right now in a period of backlash. There's a lot of uh, pushback. Uh, we've seen uh, some really dramatic uh, reversals. Uh, just Louisiana is the most recent example. Uh, we've seen some attempts to uh, roll back uh, some of the reforms, and those attempts have often been uh, been uh, been resisted uh, by pretty strong coalitions. And it, it, this may not sit well with the audience, but it's not as bad right now as it was in the 80s and in the 90s when there was no there was, is really hard to resist uh, that sort of drive to punish uh, more and more severely that led to uh, mass incarceration, mass supervision, uh, punitive excess. So we should take some uh, solace from the fact that uh, the coalitions have emerged actually pretty strong right now uh, to resist uh, the change, but the resist the pushback. But the 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 question coming from the audience is a different one and uh, asks us to imagine a, a different time. And this is where I am, am optimistic. I think that uh, for a variety of reasons, and I would credit the Black Lives Matter movement, I would credit the reaction to the murder of George Floyd, I would credit the broad right-left coalition that has held pretty strong over these years for, uh, for reducing mass incarceration. So there are lots of reasons to think that the uh, politics uh, will change, that they are changing, and there will be a time you know, not immediately, but in the not too distant future, when people are elected with a much more uh, nuanced understanding of how to respond to crime, that does not include just more and more punishment. That's been the that's been the answer: crime, more punishment; crime, more punishment. We have to find ways to disassociate the criminal justice system and its punitive power from our response to crime, and think more creatively about how to respond to crime. And elected officials who run on that platform 
uh, and there are lots of people doing message testing and uh, poll test polling on, on, on different messages. Uh, Vera in particular is leading the way there. That's, that's the future. Uh, and the coalitions that have arisen, uh, young people, people of color, uh, people uh, justice impacted populations, that's, that's going to hold their feet to the fire so that when the, the crime rises again, which it will, they're not going to engage in that knee jerk uh, response towards more and more punishment. And that leads to another audience question, which is about this bipartisan justice coalition that you mentioned um, that has been so strong for decades. You know, we we know um, that you can have public safety without the harms of mass incarceration, right? Public safety and reduced crime um, and a fair and just criminal legal system certainly go hand in hand, and we all know that. And there's a bipartisan criminal justice reform coalition that has been working for decades um, to pass legislation, to educate policymakers, voters on the need to have a more fair, a more equitable criminal legal system, and how that can um, also go along with protecting our communities. There has been some worry um, that given the politics, given that 2024 is an election year, um, that in highly politicized periods like now, that that um, bipartisan coalition is not as strong. Khalil and Nikichi, I'd love to know your thoughts about that work and how we can continue to work across party lines to protect our communities without doubling down on the punitive policies of the past that we know didn't make us safer. Yeah, well, listen. If it's me or Nikichi go first, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, give uh, uh, you know deference to Nikichi. So please, uh, actually, I was gonna give deference to you, Kuli. I'm not so much in the thick <laughs> and throes of um, of coalitions at this particular uh, time, but I will say we were effective in the past. If it were not for um, uh, the left and right talking together, the Second Chance Act of 2008 would not have passed. First of all, the um, the rape, Prison Rape Elimination Act earlier than that wouldn't have passed. Definitely the Fair Sentencing Act, which reduced the disparity of crack and powder cocaine would not have passed. And the um, Second Chance Act, uh, mm -hmm. uh, First Step Act, excuse me, would not have uh, passed as well. So bipartisan coalitions are very important and very uh, uh, pertinent. It has worked in the past, so maybe you can talk about what's happening currently <laughs> with yeah. respect to that. Is I'm kind of into my yeah. No, Nikichi is exactly. Uh, you touched on all of the points that I would have uh, said um, around um, you know what's currently happening. I mean, look right now. Uh, so I was in D.C. yesterday, and you know it was the 15th anniversary of the Second Chance Act which again was a bipartisan uh, supported bill at a, at, at a very different time in the country's history. Um, and it was done underneath the president that I think many people were, um, were pleasantly to some extent surprised that he was supportive of that. Um, if we look at what's happening now with uh, reform bills that are being passed across the country, they're happening in what would be considered to be red states. Um, and so uh, how do we keep that up? One is that we have to, you know, to Nikichi's point, we have to acknowledge the wins. And sometimes that may mean acknowledging something that we as advocates may feel like it's not the best piece of legislation that could have passed around criminal justice reform. I know that there are a number of people that um, are pro and against the First Step Act, but irregardless of how you feel about that, the, it, uh, irregardless about whatever administration it passed underneath and how you may feel about that administration, we cannot discredit the fact that that happened. And the reason why it leads to the second point, because it is an iterative process. If we do not acknowledge bipartisan support for legislation, there will not be bipartisan support because whether we admit it or not, whether we like to admit it or not, elected officials are, they are open to criticism and they sometimes buckle to that criticism. And they have to see the support coming from communities, particularly the advocacy community, when they are actually able to sit down and agree on some things. And you're right, at a very divisive time in our country's history, uh, criminal justice reform just is one of those issues that 
irregardless of where you sit on the spectrum of political ideology, the reality is that it works for everyone. Yes, you can achieve public safety and achieve uh, um, uh, uh, um, accountability for people who do commit crimes. Yes, you can do things like cut, uh, cut savings and increase the level of humanity that a person uh, 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 faces uh, when they are uh, being detained or incarcerated. Doesn't mean that the entire system is perfect, but the reality is that we have to uh, uh, acknowledge the wins because it is a, it is an iterative process. And then, lastly, which I think this is a hard part for for uh, for, uh, for 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 some advocates, is crediting success to the person that again you know may not be someone that you agree with on all issues. Again, I was in D.C. yesterday, and I heard. I heard um, uh, uh, elected official after elected official, some of them were R's, some of them were D's, acknowledge each other and the willingness that they had to come to the table and say, yes, we agree on this issue. I think that's pivotal. Again, irregardless of how you feel about whoever signed it, whatever governor signed it, whatever mayor signed it, whatever president signed it, and say, yes, irregardless of how I feel about that person, I may disagree on a million things with that person, but when it came to this particular bill, they signed it, and I have to acknowledge that, and I have to show elected officials that I acknowledge that because we need them to pass bills, and so we can't we can't pass any piece of legislation unless there is bipartisan support. And again, with criminal justice, it just continuously shows that uh, that bipartisan support is there, and if we don't if we don't acknowledge the wins and encourage our elected officials, the bipartisan support will show up, but it'll show up in more punitive. Uh, pieces of legislation. Thank you for that, Khalil and Akichi. We have another audience question um, that I think is really important. We have a lot of students watching today. Not everyone who's in our audience is sitting in Congress, and many of them want to know what can they do as individuals? What can they do to encourage their communities, um, their faith-based institutions to push for change in the criminal legal system? Um, you know, can, can people make phone calls? Can they write letters? Can they write op-eds? You know, what have you seen in terms of just individual and community support that can be critical to making criminal legal change in this country? And this is a question for anyone. Let me just pipe up real quick. People can get this book. <laughs> <laughs> Excessive punishment. I mean, it lays it all out uh, right there. People need to become educated. Forums like this is one uh, aspect of helping that to happen, doing stuff on social media, bite size this thing up, you know, for the younger generations who aren't going to necessarily pick up uh, the book, but in ways and in, 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 in measures that they can um, uh, understand and that will motivate them uh, to go on and write those letters or make those phone calls and, and do those sort of things. I just wanted to pipe that in. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really, really, um, that, that's an excellent point, Nikichi. Uh, yes, read the book. And uh, to that uh, point, um, you know, do some historical analysis. I think that trying to recreate the wheel um, is sometimes arduous and it's very difficult to find out that you actually are trying to recreate the wheel once you've already started down that process. So I would say, yes, read this book, um, do a ton of research. There are a number of books out there that can kind of give not only full historical breakdown of how we got to this thing called mass incarceration, but how that uh, how that road is all is not all that different from some of the other atrocities that has happened in this country. To place it in some historical context, I think that's important. I don't think that it should be done in a way that is a deterrent, but really in a way uh, to acknowledge the past so we're not doomed to repeat it, as the saying goes. The only thing I would add to uh, that is. Uh, everybody and young people in particular should organize. Just figure out how to get something going on your campus or within your uh, reference group. Uh, talk to your uh, elected officials, uh, particularly your state officials. Most of what we're talking about here is not Congress. It's state legislatures that have that, that have passed the laws that uh, have driven so much of the rise in incarceration. Uh, connect with uh, groups that are uh, doing the advocacy, figure out your place in it, what is your role, um, but don't don't be a bystander. Just uh, don't let this happen. This is too important, and this is goes right to the core of our democracy and our aspirations for racial justice. Uh, we can't, If we don't get this right, uh, it's, the country uh, is not going to be what we would like it to be. 
Can I just say one more thing real quick? And that is, we really need to avoid um, repetition of policies that may be well-intentioned and sound really, really good, yet they result in over-criminalization, they result in uh, racial application of those uh, policies. We've been down these slippery slopes in the past, and uh, we need to really guard against that. Sounding good stuff isn't necessarily good um, in, in this system. Valuable advice from our panelists. And we only have five more minutes. I'd like to ask each of you a question that is incredibly important given the polarization in this country right now and the need to ensure a fair and equitable criminal legal system. So I'm hoping we can end on a positive note. And in a couple of sentences, what gives each of you hope that we can make real progress towards a more fair, just, and equitable criminal legal system? And I'll, I'll start with you, Jeremy. Well, I, I like ending on, on an optimistic note. Uh, I'm by nature an optimist. And it may be hard to be optimistic in the current moment because we've seen some pretty uh, strong uh, resistance uh, to the reform movement. But taking a big step back in the way that uh, we've talked about today, there have been lots of wins, lots of really important wins. Uh, the coalition that has come together uh, is is a very is a historically important uh, reality. It's fueled a lot by the voices of formerly incarcerated people and justice impacted individuals and communities, and that is that voice cannot be stifled. Uh, and the next generation is uh, is what gives me a lot of hope that. Uh, having done this work for a long time, uh, I'm very optimistic that we will end up in a better place, not immediately, but we're on our way and have to keep that, uh, as Nikichi said, that uh, the, keep our eye on that prize. Mm -hmm. Nikichi and Khalil, do you have yes. um, a couple of sentences about what gives you hope that we can make progress towards a more fair, just, yeah. and equitable criminal legal system? I'll go next if I can, so that way I don't leave. Uh, I don't. I don't have all the pressure of responding after Nikichi and Jeremy. Um, I, 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 I'll just say the one thing that makes me hopeful is the fact that we have so many young people on this platform right now. That that the young generation now is really, really inquisitive about why certain things are the way that they are, and they will, as you know, kind of cliche as it sounds, they are the future. And the reality is that if they are here attending events like this, reading books like the ones that 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 we got published, like it is going to be a beautiful future because many of them have um, have a, a level of in, inquisitiveness that forces uh, uh, society to answer questions that has been too easy to avoid. So I just want to add in, and it's really a conglomeration of what Jeremy said and what Khalil is all about, is one thing, primary thing that makes me feel hope about the future of criminal justice reform is the growing presence of formerly incarcerated people at the forefront of efforts to reform uh, this uh, criminal punishment system. When I first started working on these issues, not only were there not formerly incarcerated people at the table, I was one of extremely few black people period at the table talking about issues directly impacting black and brown communities so thankfully things have dramatically changed and i'm so very glad that i am still around to witness it <laughs> well thank you jeremy khalil and Akichi, for all of your incredible work to improve our system of justice in this country thank you for your beautiful essays Thank you to our audience for all of your questions. I wish we had time to answer them all. The Brennan Center looks forward to seeing you at future events. And to be the first to know when events are announced, be sure to sign up for the events newsletter at brennancenter.org slash events. My name is LB Eisen, and thank you all for coming and joining us today. <laughs>